Hey friends, I'm Ash. I'm Elle. We are Lobby Cosplay. And this is Shit Cosplayers Say, the listeners episode for season three. We're back with another listeners episode. Woo woo. It's like we never left. I mean, this this hiatus we didn't leave because we posted content and it was extraordinarily short because the next episode that you'll get is the first episode of season one. So, or season four, not one. Uh-huh. One? We're going back in time. The next episode that you will get is the first episode of season four. So we did a much shorter hiatus since we had to do a hiatus in the middle of September due to uh, ICL. So we'll be back very quickly. If this is not enough to satisfy you, we'd like to remind you that we did an episode on Cost Talk, which you can find on YouTube. We'll put links in the show notes as well as Cosplay Cafe, which just happened over the weekend, that you can also find on YouTube, and we will put the link in the show notes. So if you haven't gotten enough of us, you can find us on two other shows. And we have even more shows coming with other people, so stay tuned, because we're apparently very popular for other cosplay podcasts this year, (laughs) so you're going to see us all over the place. There is no escape. You cannot escape us. In the first episode of season four, we will also be making some appearance announcements. So stay tuned for that as well. But today, we wanted to bring you a compilation of some of our favorite listener stories. So we get these by people who listen to the podcast, either DMing us or emailing us random stories about conventions, cosplay, interactions sky's the limit you can send us anything you want to there's no like theme or you know restriction or limit on what you can send us you just have to let us know if you want us to credit you or not um, because sometimes we will choose to make a story anonymous if we feel that it may cause somebody like an issue or if it's requested that kind of thing so you know let us know which one you want and we are more than happy to uh see if we can use your story so we've got a few of them for you today. Um, it's been been a while since we've done one of these. Give or take a year or so. Give or take a year. Yeah, we tend to only end up getting about one of these a year out. Um, it's just kind of the way of the game. We'd love to do them more often, but, you know, life. We're trying to keep up with the regular schedule for the podcast. So our first story for today is from Jax from the Conventional Podcast, which you may remember that we were on their podcast a couple seasons ago. And Jax wrote in, That time when my niece broke a giant sword once as a baby and again as a teen in almost the exact same way. I did Samehara for my Kasume cosplay and melted the center because I was young and I didn't know that sealing before spray paint is probably the way to go. So they were making a sword and forgot to prime it. And as we all know, when you don't do that, it uh, it eats your foam. Nom, nom, nom. I repaired it using Gorilla Glue and paper mache, which somehow was actually quite sturdy after it cured. Now, my niece was a baby and an escape artist and would sneak out of her playpen and wander into my room often. I left my room for a moment after double-checking to see that she was in her playpen and went into the kitchen. Minutes later, I hear the loudest snap come from my room and my sister laughing. I run back to see my niece in the middle of this broken sword and with only 72 hours before the con, and I had myself a good cry. Somehow I fixed it and was able to laugh about it. But, 10 years later... I decided to upgrade the sword and use it for Killer B at the last second with three days till the con. There's a theme here. There is. There's Jax, I think you need to learn how to not con crunch. I think that that might be your your first. uh, This very very specific 72 hour window. There's a very specific 72 hour window here. My niece, now a teen is rollerblading outside while my newly upgraded sword is drying and trips on some gravel and elbows this sword in the exact same spot and freaks out. She was fine because the sword broke her fall. I come back out hearing that familiar snap and I just can't help but laugh. 
Um, I think that there's something very important out of that statement that you missed. It's not just elbowed. It's the people's elbow, like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Oh, yes. Yes. Kabow. People's elbow. Yes. (laughs) Straight into that sword. Yikes. I want to know where the sword is now. Yes. Jax, we need to know where the sword is now. Did you throw it away? Did you display it proudly in its broken form? What did you do with the sword? Like the sword of Gondor, like shattered in pieces. Right? On display. On display in all its glory. It's good. It is good. good. It is good. But I think somebody needs to learn how to not con crunch their their props, and that might help with the... uh... I mean, maybe by this point, because all we know is that there's a decade in between, but we don't know how long ago... (laughs) That's true, we don't. We don't know. These two instances are because, you know, Aeson's a very old con. That's right. Aeson is a very, very old con. Our next story is from Zenith, um, Zen Zero Cosplay, who says, I was waiting outside the venue for Otacon 2021 with my friend waiting for her mom to pick her up dressed as Moana. I was just staring into space until a black jeep full of ladies stuck in traffic had all, and I mean all. All, I know this for a fact because all their flashlights were on, their phones, taking a video of me, shouting, Moana! Ah! Moana! Going back to reality, I smiled and waved at them, but in my head, WTF, what do I do? So, the performer in me waved at them, waved my oar, and sang at the top of my lungs the chorus of How Far I Will Go. After that, they played the song in their car, and they all belted out the song, and they had so much fun. I was living vicariously with their enthusiasm. It reminds me of that time when that van stopped us while we were walking to the mall, dressed as Erden Scald, <laughs> and needed to take our picture and block traffic in Rosemont. Yes, we're there <laughs> when we were walking. Um, yeah. In Rosemont to the mall, and I I also imagine that this was like a like a bachelorette party or something in this car. Like that's what my brain thinks because they were so enthusiastic <laughs> about um, Moana's existence. Now, if you haven't seen Zen's Moana, it's very accurate. So legit looks like Moana is just standing there outside of the film. So, I mean, I would be really excited if I was a big Moana fan, if I saw them walking down the street. I approve of this entire thing. I mean, I want somebody to belt songs after me. Like, yes. We've never done Disney characters, so we don't know if this is just a thing where like people sing at you or not. I would imagine it probably is. I think you have a lot more in-character interactions with Disney-type characters. Well, definitely with children. And very enthusiastic adults. Yeah. I mean, really, my only, like, in-character interaction that I ever get is when I'm dressed as Harley with kids. Like, the kids are interested in her. Used to get it as Chat Noir. That's true. But that was also a lot of adult women as well. (laughs) Again, same concept. Small kids, adult women, enthusiastic adults. Zen for Mystic Messenger, but again, adult women. Who fawned over my existence. Well, you know. I just, I want somebody to belt out in song as I walk. Can we just have a bard follow us around and sing songs for us? No, I have, like, Monty Python stuck in right? my head. <laughs> he was not afraid to die. Oh, brave Sir Robin. We have another story from... Australia from Henchwench. Oh goodness. This this is like one of the best examples of pure and utter dedication of a contestant. <laughs> All right. So, Henchwench says, "I was the Australian representative for the Championships of Cosplay at C2E2 a few years back. In my baggage, I packed a few self-made plastic bald caps." but forgot to pack them separate to the acetone I used to thin the edges. The acetone didn't leak, 
but the vapors in my makeup kit were enough to break down every single cap. Oh, no. One by one, I pulled them out, ready to do my special effects makeup, and each one fell apart like wet tissue paper. I'm so sad. (laughs) So the costume that she has for this contest requires the character to be bold. So since I was representing my country and all, and I only had a couple hours before judging, I called down to the concierge for a bunch of razors and slowly shaved off all my waist-length hair until I was totally bald. Fun times. I cried a lot, but I got a good story out of it. I am traumatized. (laughs) I would be so upset, but I would totally do the same thing. Like, what do you do? What else do you do? Like, you're you're freaking at the finals of the crown championship. Like, yeah, go big or go home at that point. There's You're ripping that band-aid right off. You just came from freaking Australia to Chicago, Illinois to compete in the finals. There is no other option. Like, there is no other option. That is 100% what happens is you just shave your head. You do. Hair grows back. Hair grows back. Fine. I mean... Obviously, if she picked the costume, she already knows she looks decent bald. So, like, <laughs> I mean, okay, yeah, you know, no, I mean, I, I cannot, and I'm sure people would disagree with us and go, um, no, but as a competitive cosplayer, I literally see no other option but this. There, there is no, there other is option. no other option. That is the you option. Shave your hair because you have a stage to get on. Like, that's, that's how it goes. Like, there's The show must go on. There is no other option. Speaking of the show going on, our next one is also kind of a hysterical happenstance at a contest. This story comes from Lady Sells, who says, at a con in 2020, (gasps) there were cons in 2020. I'm going to guess this was before March of 2020, probably. I mean, probably. I mean, I I know what con this is, but I chose not to put the con in here. Um, At a con in 2020, we were all backstage in the green room watching this show, the contestants. The person who controlled the camera that was being fed into our projector had a very obvious shoe foot fetish. As in, they'd zoom in on the feet during the skits, so none of us got to watch what was actually happening on stage. My handler at the time led a bit of a rebellion. The whole green room would shout, shoes, every time they did so. A Sabre Cosler bravely put hi in gaff tape on their shoe to try and call them out on the shoe zooming. And of course, was the first shoe to not get zoomed in on was definitely one of the funnier things in recent memories of cons. And I do have um I do have a picture of, <laughs> of the, the screen shoe? of them like zooming in on shoes. Well and you wonder like did this person actually like have a thing for feet or were they just like not paying attention and like playing on their phone and like the camera kept slipping down? If there was one entry where that didn't happen, then my guess is they were doing it on purpose. But also, like, you know that this is going at least to, like, a room full of people, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why you would think that this was, like, a good plan. I have questions. I know. I have questions about who they got to film their contest, because this seems very, like, counterproductive to what you usually want for a, like, record of your contest. Well, and did this only go to the green room? Was this safe for posterity? Um, did it go live on the internet? I don't know if this particular con posts their show, but I think they do. Because I've seen snippets from it, but that doesn't mean that like other people didn't record it for them or that kind of thing. Um, but most cons do record their contests, even if they don't post them online for just record. So... I don't know what this this person was thinking. Um, but now apparently for their year of 2020, they have a record of every contestant's shoes. I would love to see what this video looks like. <laughs> Can you imagine? You just watch this entire masquerade and it's just shoes. Like, just shoes. Nothing else. Shoes. It reminds me of that, that old um, YouTube video song about shoes. 
It's an old YouTube video from like 2006 by Liam Kyle Sullivan, and it's a song about shoes. And he's singing about like his obsession with shoes. Okay. It's absolutely hysterical. Um, but yes, that's what this reminds me of is the shoe song. If you if 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 I played it, you would probably recognize it because it used to be everywhere. Now I'm like shoes. 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 So our next two stories are anonymous. These are WTF Karen stories. We all love a good Karen story, don't we? So our first Karen story says, At a contest, not once, but twice, I had a run-in with a competitor's mom who just circled the green room and talked smack to intimidate the other competitors prior to judging. She was like 60, and it was the craziest thing. She kept giving backhanded compliments, then dropping the hammer with a rude comment. Then she'd just walk off. She'd say something like, I love your costume. Great color story. Who knows? If the judges are looking for something really simple, basic build, maybe you'll win. Still one of the wildest experiences. I think she was just trying to throw people off their game. But it was mucho bizarre. Can you imagine? I mean, actually, I can because we've seen this I, before. I can imagine. And then on the flip side of this, I'm like, why is somebody's six-year-old mother in the green room? Well, I mean, maybe if she... I mean, that they could have been young still. They could have. You know, if you have your kids in your late 30s, early 40s, like, they could still be in high school. Like, that's that's possible, you know? So they they could still be young enough that they have... Because usually if you're under the age of 18, you have to have an adult with you. What really gets me is that this this keeps happening, which means she's not being removed from contests. That's, yeah. No, I, I would say, wow, that's crazy. I can't believe that happened, except for the fact that I do 100% like believe that that happened. I mean, we've seen Having this. dealt with other, like contest moms before like i'm like yep can't see this happening 100 percent. i mean we've totally seen this before with people running around bashing other people for the benefit of someone else like we've seen this we've seen this with people in this age group that's it's not a like uncommon thing it's just unfortunate that it's not an uncommon thing unfortunate it's unfortunate all right so we have Yet another contest Karen story for you. And this one starts, I was running a costume contest and our judges were an International Costumers Guild board member, a professional seamstress, and a professional costumer for a local theater, and a very well-known award-winning steampunk costumer and maker. One of the local seamstresses entered the contest in a modified wedding dress as a popular anime character, but had serious issues with the costumes staying up and together. After the awards were announced, she went off and cornered me, demanding to know why she hadn't won. I told her that all judges' decisions were final, but that I would review the notes and send her their scores via email after the con. She screamed that that wasn't enough, and that I should immediately overturn the results and announce her the winner. I declined again, stating that the judge's results were final. She literally turned on her heel and started yelling the judge's names through the hall, attempting to hunt them down. I got a security team member to page the con runner and explain quickly what was happening, while sending two of my contest staff to bring her back so that we could appropriately hear and consider her concerns to get her off the show floor. They retrieved her, and the showrunner asked what the show could do to help with the situation. After she explained her anger was due to the fact that her costume was the best in the show, as anyone could see. While the corset continued to sag and drop at the front, and she was continually adjusting it. This went on for about 45 minutes as we tried to calm her down. The doors closed, vendors started to pack and leave, and she was still railing against the judges and calling me inept for refusing to overrule them and award her costume 
and rescind the other awards given out. Eventually, it was just me and the showrunner standing there with her as everyone else went to break down the hall. The showrunner just kept asking what the show could do and what would be a good resolution. Finally, after two more hours of raving, she realized we were not going to overturn the results, so she demanded to be a judge at the next show. The showrunner made her a judge at the next show and then added another judge to compensate for her vote in case she became unstable during judging, and we had to remove her, which ended up being the case when the judges realized that a contestant she was advocating for strongly to win was also her sister, and that had made her sister's costume and disqualified her sister, at which point security escorted her from the hall. Apparently, she spent the next three hours screaming and raving on Facebook Live from the parking lot about how the Best in Show award had been stolen from her twice. I just... Wow. Yeah. (laughs) This is... Okay, well... This is the most extreme version of this that I have ever heard. I, I totally appreciate their, like, customer service voice thing that I hear in my head when we're going through the first part about this, how they're just sitting here and letting her, like, go. Like, I talk about it occasionally, but I'm a certified crisis negotiator, and I'm like, oh, this is exactly what we're doing here. We are completely stalling for time. Um, I will say, you you probably made a huge mistake when you added her as a judge. We're, <laughs> like, um, but I'm sure hindsight is twenty twenty, and you don't need me to tell you that. And you will not make the same mistake again. So, wow. It, Yikes. I just... Also, how do you... How do you make a costume and then sit on the judging panel? Like... Well, because that was, that was the plan, was that if she sat on the judging panel, then she would make sure that her costume won. Like, that was yeah, the whole plan. Yeah, it's not like you can go around telling everybody that you made the best in show costume that you were on the judging panel for. Like... Like, that's... That was the plan, though. I know. Well, this person is obviously not the brightest crayon in the box, given that they obviously had a costume that was falling apart and thought they should win. (sighs) You know, this person seems a bit unstable, which you do run into occasionally. What? Are you pearl clutching? What? (gasps) How could you say that? I don't know that I have ever in 20 years of competing... And helping to run contests and being involved in contests ever met someone quite this determined to make a convention completely change, like, their rulings. Yeah, that's that's an extra level of special. Like I said, I do definitely give kudos, though. Um, Because initially, obviously, distracting her while everybody else is leaving allows your judges and the other contestants and anybody else to clear the area. But the fact that you, like kept it going the entire time that the show floor was being broken down like after the con closed like you put in your extra credit on that one for yeah, sure this poor showrunner like kudos to you for doing your best because you're obviously n- no showrunner except for ash except for ash is trained to deal with this type of situation <laughs> and we have dealt i mean as showrunners we've dealt with some and like assistant showrunners because nowadays we pretty much are like behind the scenes consults for for shows um we've had to step in and help with situations before um but never to this extent like i've never seen anything like this like it's this is like kudos to you for i'm going to assume not having any background experience to deal with something like this handling it the best you can like i can't even blame the showrunner for making her a judge because honestly after like two plus hours looks like it was probably about three three plus hours of negotiating with this person like if that's what got her to stop that i don't blame them like they can't stand there all day and if this person was as determined as it sounds they probably were not going to stop until they got what they felt they deserved. You know, you have to also consider your own safety and safety of others in these kinds of situations. So, poor showrunner. Kudos to you. Yes, I applaud you. 
for your handling of this terrible situation. Well, I know a lot of people would be going, well, that showrunner, they shouldn't have blah, blah, blah. But it's like, what was this poor person supposed to do? Oh, yeah. Well, and you have no idea how in the middle of a crisis you are going to respond to a situation until it actually occurs. Like, it's great to be like a backseat driver and say, oh, well, I would totally do this. You don't know that because it doesn't matter how trained you are for a situation like this to possibly occur until it actually occurs. You don't know how you're actually going to respond. And yeah, I think that they handled it the best that they could. Well, like, I mean, I can think of situations where I've been berated by contestants before as a showrunner, not even remotely to this extent. It's very stressful. Like you get your fight and your fight or flight just like goes through the roof because this person is like yelling at you because they didn't win. And it's like, what are you supposed to do with that? Like, yeah, no, definitely kudos for them for protecting their other contestants and protecting their judges um, and not letting this person like corner them in a parking garage or a bathroom. And I only say those two things because we know people that have been cornered in parking garages and bathrooms and i cannot imagine how utterly terrifying that would be to be completely by yourself with this very deranged person (laughs) like don't do that yeah don't inappropriate as we've said many times before do not corner your judges and ask them why you did not win please don't it's very stressful for us because we're not going to have an answer for you so follow the proper channels if you want actual feedback, but don't corner your judges. Like, it's not cool. Um, this poor showrunner needs the best in show award for, yes, like, being able to handle this crazy situation that they were in. And their assistant, apparently, who helped out with this whole process. I'm going to guess that the person that wrote this in is, is, is the assistant, um, since they were there for the whole thing. Yeah. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, there's some crazy dad to your weekend. That is. So next time you hear us, we will be the first episode of season four. We have some big surprises for you for the start of season four. Some big changes are coming. So stay tuned for that episode. But until then, I'm Ash. I'm Elle. We are Lavi Cosplay. And this is Shit Cosplayers Say. You've been listening to Shit Cosplayers Say, an LVC production. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Podcast SCS. Our website is lavicosplay.com. Have a fun, crazy con or cosplay-related story, absurd cosplay question, or just something in general to share with us? Email us at podcastscs at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and remember, just because you can, doesn't mean you should.